Hey there, students. So we are going to be diving into one of my favorite theorists, Irving Goffman, and talking about stigma, like stigma management. And this is what I call the stigma lecture, right? So we're going to be diving into one of the most prolific, if not one of the most arguably profound theorists that talks about deviance and stigma management. So let's jump into it, shall we? So let's get started with this, right? So this week, we discuss one of my favorite sociologists, as I said. Irving Goffman. You may remember him from his very popular theory on image or impression management, where he argues that we are all actors on the stage performing for others. Goffman is also the major contributor to the sociological understanding of stigma and stigma management. And in his 1963 book, Stigma, Notes on the Management of a Spoiled Identity, defines stigma in detail. Goffman started, stated, stigma is a process by which the reaction of others spoil normal identity. So we can tell that the approach, the study of deviance and stigma from a relativist point of view, right? Goffman defines, or, def or definition of stigma is an attribute that is deeply discrediting. What is deeply discrediting and who decides is the question, right? Well, that comes from what is socially acceptable and what is considered not, right? So if an attribute falls outside the norm, it may be socially discredited. Goffman identifies three forms, a person may be labeled with a stigma if they have a character flaw, a physical one, or if they are part of a group that isn't accepted. The example of women who are heavily tattooed from this week's documentary may fit into the physical flaw along with the being defined by a group. So you can see that there are not mutually exclusive categories. A person's deviant label may overlap with different stigma forms. While tattoos are increasingly accepted in society and can be viewed as beautiful art form, the example from the cover documentary shows that for women who are heavily tattooed, the everyday reactions from others very much to fit the examples of Goffman's ideas. Now, for sake of this conversation, you'll see here, I do also have a tattoo. And I remember when my parents basically told me if I ever got one, that I would be disowned. Fun fact, long term later, my I have a tattoo back here, which I can't show you, which is a Celtic knot, just because I don't want to turn around and like take my shirt off. That's not right. Um, but my father actually has an identical one right here of my tattoo, who he said he would die before he ever got a tattoo. So attitudes, behaviors, beliefs, and conditions change. So does the view on norms, right? So it's very interesting. Goffman's definition of stigma is very much powerful when we look at this types of ideas, right? So an attribute that is deeply discredited with what is deeply discrediting and who decides, that comes down to the conversations again, like I just mentioned with tattoos. So Goffman also explains that there's two types of stigma, discredited and discreditable. And this is a very powerful topic. I spend a lot of time in my in-person classes talking about this because I think it's something that has a lot of ways you can tie into Du Boisian sociology and other dynamics. But let's start from here. Uh, Goffman also explains two types of stigma, the discredited and discreditable. The discredited is a stigma that is not hidden from plain view. People can see it and immediately apply a deviant label. So from the documentary, tattooed women walking down the street, being stared at or trying to shop at a grocery store with people coming up to talk. This is a discredited stigma because the person doesn't or cannot hide their tattoos, right? Other examples that are discredited may be a person in a wheelchair or an extremely tall or short person. These characteristics are out in the open and to see and label. The other types of stigma is the discreditable one. This is one where we may not be able to immediately tell that there is a stigma attached to a person. So in our tattooed woman example, the professor who hides her tattoos from her students should be an example of discreditable stigma. You may also, if you should choose to want another example, is think about the neurodivergencies such as mood disorders or other types that are not visible either through treatment or just not obvious. If they are exposed and people learn of them, it changes everything. And as we've talked about earlier with retrospective labeling, you can see that the context matters to stigma management. The professor may not, the professor may be discreditable to her students, but is discredited when she shows her tattoos and others such as the, those at the grocery store, or when someone says they have X disorder and suddenly we discredit them and retrospectively label them as deviant. You can also look at to women who have had several abortions. They would likely be harshly discredited if other people were to know about the situation because it goes outside the social norms. However, you can't tell by looking at someone if they have that this character trait, can you? So it kind of ties to that Du Boisian idea of double consciousness. It's really worth kind of having a conversation on. 
There are three <clears throat> different ways of going about managing or concealing stigma. And in this in this slide right here, let me find a good place for my face. All right, there we go. <laughs> uh, there are they are called <clears throat> passing, covering, and disclosure. Let's take a look at passing first. Passing simply means to cover up deviance from others. So the person who tries to come off as not having deviant attributes and fits in with everyone else, great example of neurodivergence, example, right? Acting as if they were not, acting as if they were neurotypical. Passing is done by avoiding stigma symbols, which are those that object, objects that would tip off others to the stigma. So avoiding being shown having behaviors or mannerisms, a neurodivergent can pass as neurotypical, or a professor with tattoos can hide the ink to avoid the link, right? or using disidentifiers to distract or fool people from thinking that the person doesn't have stigma, as a discreditable person may lead a double life because of that. That is one where the stigma stays hidden and one who certain people know about, right? Which seems to be the case with those who suffer from neurological disorders or mood disorders and are in the situation of, a, of the, uh, and are in that situation of the said tattooed woman or professor as talked about and shown in the cover documentary. Covering often happens when significant others help the person hide the stigma from others. So if a person is in this convict, the close family members may know about the prison time and they may help the person create stories that depict him or her as a law-abiding person so that they are not subject to the deviant labels. A third way to manage the stigma is to disclose it. Sometimes when forms of concealment don't work, letting people know that one has a deviant stigma is done. This can be cathartic and therapeutic for people who have been secretly carrying discreditable stigma. It may also accept or reject the others. But think about this, it may also be a proscription, prescription like we talked about. To disclose it first means that we can manage the stigma, right? There are two, two paths for normalizing stigma once a person discloses it. Let me kind of go to the slide here for you on that. And that is the process of, they may be subjected to deviant disavowal or other people's ignoring the deviant stigma and pretend it doesn't exist. So if, well, if one of the tattooed women were to show her tattoos to a person who just didn't look at them or mention them, and continued on like they weren't there, that would be deviance disavowal. Or if someone with, let's say, bipolar, for example, came forward about dealing with the issue and the person just didn't acknowledge it and never brings it up again, this would also be an example as well. Or there may be, or there, or there may be deviance avowal, right? Where the stigma is acknowledged but presented in a positive light. So there may be joking about the stigma or talking about how having it could be beneficial. Someone mentioning all the famous bipolars in the arts and the media, and then saying they are geniuses, and maybe you are as well, or such as with the little boy in the cover documentary who said that the other kids think his parents are rock stars, and everyone laughed about it and moved on. Uh, another important thing to mention in regards to this idea of, let me go back to slide here, passing is passing is also commonly used inside communities, uh, such as our book talks about as those who are multi-ethnic or multi-racial, uh, and those who want to try to benefit or are impacted negatively and positively on the color of their skin, the lightness, right, the level of melanin, uh, and also how sometimes they have to try to pass inside their own culture because they feel if they don't have a tertiary adherence to it, right, that they will receive stigma as not being seen as enough in that club, in that circumstance, right? So it becomes really powerful on this idea of letting people know we're disclosing the stigma to courses normalization, disavowal, and avowal, Right, we just covered that. <clears throat> so when we think about this idea of Goffman, we look at this person who wrote a lot of his work on the idea of presentation of self in everyday life, his, one of his most prolific books. Goffman's works have been seminal. The importance of starting the point for many studies on stigma and stigma management. The textbook reading this week are based on the starting points and they provide an example of different forms of stigma and how people cope and manage their stigmatized or stigma labels, right? Think about how you act or if you have any discredited or discreditable stigma and how you manage them. So tying in these images you're seeing, right? In the bottom, we have Goffman, and then we have Pilgrim's Progress type structure. If you're a Christian person, I grew up with a lot of Christian guilt, uh, that we carry our burdens on our back, right? Or all the fingers pointing at you when we present ourselves, when we're wearing masks to manage our impressions, right? This work around Goffman is very seminal and very important. But this does bring us to the end of this lecture. And I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture when we talk about structured deviance. I will speak with you then.